Um, and today we are very um, happy to be joined by our special guest, Sophia Azeb. Sophia is a, an assistant professor in the Department of English Language and Literature at the University of Chicago. Her current book project, Another Country, Constellations of Blackness in Afro-Arab Cultural Expression, examines how Blackness and Black identity is variously translated, mobilized, circulated, and contested by African-American, Afro-Caribbean, African, and Afro-Arab cultural and political figures in North Africa and Europe in the 20th century. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our friend, Sophia. Thank you so much for introducing me, Jacqueline. Um, I'm just gonna start this PowerPoint really quickly. I'm not good at multitasking. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, I uh, thank you, Jacqueline, for introducing me. Um, and thank you to Tracy, Tiara, and Beth, as well as our director, Riley Snorin, for all the time and energy they've invested in putting together this series. Um, I also want to thank everyone else at the CSRPC, Marilyn, Corey, Eden, and Angel, and anyone else I may be unintentionally forgetting for maintaining the vibrancy of the center. Um, and I'd lastly like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here and be in conversation today. As Jacqueline noted, I'm working on a little book about transnational and translational Blackness. Um, and the Afro-Arab by constructing a genealogy of transatlantic, trans-Saharan, trans-Nile, and trans-Mediterranean diasporic currents through an archive of 20th century African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Arab, and African literature, music, festival, and politics. And here's a little snapshot of one of those festivals, the Pan-African Festival of 1969, which took place in the capital of Algeria, Algiers. Um, I'm not very good at improvising a talk, um, so I prepared a little talk like on paper, um, but I have plenty of slides to keep everyone amused along the way, so apologies for that. My project attends to a constellation of Blackness that is theorized and lived and understood variously through proximity, phenotype, language, culture, geography, and more. I trace various processes through which Black being is realized, reformed, reimagined or resisted in moments of encounter in Afro-Arab spaces. This research demands I also account for the limitations that studying encounters and lived experiences and contradictory or contested articulations of Blackness across geography and language entails. Rarely do these translational exercises survive beyond the specific time and space in which they are initially forged, a moment like a festival, for instance. Instead, we end up with something that turns kind of intelligible and messy over time and across space, um, what the late Richard Eiten described as diasporic breathing room. Uh, to account for that, a central question that drives my research is how do Black people navigating the diaspora maneuver multiple conceptions of Blackness without sacrificing their own locally informed knowledge on how they are Black? What do moments of misrecognition and mistranslation make possible for our understanding of a Blackness that moves and changes and sounds differently across time, space, and language that focusing only on occasions of mutual legibility and recognition may not? I try to answer this question by taking up a familiar canon of Black transnational narrative, that festival and sonic cultures, and rendering it unfamiliar by drawing upon their translations elsewhere, while striving never to lose the specificity of the particular contexts that these meanings of black, made of Blackness emerge from. So you can see in this um, artwork by uh, Moroccan artist Mohamed Fataka, Africa as they like it, that North Africa has been carved off, right? So who is the they there? It's really ambiguous, but we may often think of the African diaspora or of blackness more generally and not think of North Africa. So one of the questions I have is why is the Sahara uh, a border in our imaginary of this expansive and capacious diaspora? Before I explain why I think this question is important and how my work might illuminate some potential answers, I want to focus a little bit about the centrality of questions, approaches, and orientations that drive research in the field that I am situated in, 
Black Studies. And I know I'm currently in an English department, but I am not trained in the discipline of English. So this is really where I'm coming to this question from, from the perspective of Black Studies. Trinidadian intellectual CLR James noted in 1970 that the formation of the field of Black Studies was not, quote, some sort of concession to satisfy Black students. That's not so. Rather, he says, quote, Black Studies is the complete reorganization of the intellectual life and historical outlook of the United States and world civilization as a whole. It is a chance to penetrate more into the fundamentals of Western civilization. That is what the impact of Black Studies means. And of course, the late scholar Cedric Robinson said of Western civilization that Western civilization is neither. My, my favorites. But the work of Black Studies and its institutionalization in the academy beginning in 1969 was reward coupled with risk. As African-American and gender and women's studies, Professor Roderick A. Ferguson observed, um, I'm not very good at switching slides, pardon me. Uh, the development of the interdisciplinary fields, African-American studies, Asian-American studies, Chicano studies, and so on, put specific pressures on the human sciences and the disciplines. In particular, they helped to formally introduce differences of race, gender, and sexuality into how we understood and narrated systems of work and language. So while this is ostensibly a victory for our intellectual rigor and our quest for equal representation and support in the academy, American studies scholar Lisa Lowe points out that institutionalizing such fields as ethnic studies contains an inevitable paradox. Institutionalization provides a material base within the university for a transformative critique of traditional disciplines and their traditional separations. And yet the institutionalization of any field or curriculum that establishes orthodox subjects and methods submits in part to the demands of the university and its educative function of socializing subjects into the state. So how must we, students and teachers of Black Studies, strike the balance between reorganizing the whole of intellectual life across disciplinary boundaries while resisting the appropriation of our study by the regimes of discipline and power that our own academic institutions reproduce. We might, as Stefan O'Harney and Fred Moten encourage in the undercommons, commit fully to always being a problem, to be in but not of the academy, to steal our labor, our teaching, our work, to steal back our study. To put it simply, quote, study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. The point of calling these things study is to mark the incessant and irreversible intellectuality of these activities. To do these things is to be involved in a kind of common intellectual practice. Talking, walking around, working, dancing, suffering, all of these things we do together, this is our study. If we embrace in this work of black study that intellectualism is, to paraphrase Antonio Gramsci, a system of relation, a social relation rather than merely an activity or a job, then we retrieve the sociality of our study and ourselves for what makes this intellectual work possible in the first place. So the new diaspora of race, uh, new department, sorry, of race, diaspora, and indigeneity marks an opportunity for us all communities, students, staff, and faculty alike to collectively imagine and enact new social relations that will sustain the intellectual life worlds of our work in the way that a university, by nature of its function to discipline and organize difference, quote, to make no difference, as Nick Mitchell puts it, cannot. So this leads me to my interest in how Blackness as a lived identity and experience and concept and practice is translated across the multiple and uneven terrains of the African diaspora. I follow the trace of translations and mistranslations of blackness across what I call Afro-Arab spaces, or broadly spaces and time that collapse the perceived boundaries between Arabic speaking peoples of African descent and their non-Arabic speaking counterparts in the diaspora. Informed by historian Robin D.G. Kelly's rich body of work, 
that reminds us the African diaspora is a phenomenon and phenomenal, that it is not unremarkable such a multi-directional and global community of people have for so long come together under the conceptual umbrella, umbrella of the diaspora. Informed and inspired by this, I locate the possibilities and limits for theorizing Arab African belonging to the African diaspora in my work. In this vein, I follow the trajectory, the geographic and temporal itineraries of a translational blackness that is variable and contested. Reflecting on theorist Michelle Wright's provocations on the space times of blackness, where the collective identity and interpretations of blackness are always in flux, quote, because its history is so deeply intertwined with most other global histories. I'm really intrigued by Wright's proposal that the quote, when and where, rather than the what of blackness, reveals what Wright refers to as qualitative connections, rather than quantitative sameness. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about my own work on these dynamic and nonlinear articulations of blackness alongside this idea of black study as in part sociality. To do this, I will focus on one Afro-Arab space in particular, the Provençal city of Marseille. And here's Marseille in the south of France. A port city on the Mediterranean, Marseille is the oldest city in France. It is also merely 410 nautical miles from the Algerian capital, capital of Algiers, or roughly the distance between Chicago and Omaha. If anyone's ever done that drive, I actually have weirdly. Marseille was a strategic city for the establishment of French colonization in Africa and Southwest Asia, as goods, labor, and armies from and to colonial France moved through this so-called port of empire from the 18th century onwards. It is also, depending on who you ask, an Arab city and an African city. When Marseille was liberated from a two year long German occupation during World War II, it was not by Frenchmen per se, but by the third Algerian infantry division and Moroccan Tabor, North African colonial units of the French military. To this day, French public paranoia about the Africanness and Arabness of cities like Marseille is invoked by right and left wing pundits and politicians alike to warn of unchecked immigration, unassimilable populations, and that the threat of the African continent so near Marseille always poses to France. And there's this accusation that you can get met with in Marseille a lot, which is that like Marseille turns its back on France towards Africa, like that's a bad thing. So this very truncated history means to demonstrate the centrality of a city like Marseille within the global reach of French colonialism. Thousands of French colonial subjects from Martinique to French Indochine to huge swaths of Western North Africa and the Caribbean lived, worked, and died in Marseille. But those who settled in Marseille were not always subject or beholden to the state. One famous son of the city, a man who was not born there, but whose portrayal of a singular sort of Marseille's black life and culture is indelibly attached to the city, was the Jamaican American poet and Harlem Renaissance pioneer, Claude McKay. He is commemorated to this day in the city, which in 2015 inaugurated the Passage Claude McKay, a tiny little roadway in the second arrondissement of the city, connecting the Quai de Port and the Rue de la Loge in Vieux-Port in the old port of Marseille. And so here's, you know, what we all want to be doing right now, which is sunbathing, uh, Claude McKay sunbathing in Marseille, or just outside of Marseille, and the passage where he's commemorated as a writer who was important to Marseille's history. So written between Barcelona and the Panier neighborhood of Marseille, McKay's English language novel, Banjo, A Story Without a Plot, was published in 1929. The story revolves around the titular character Banjo, quote, a great vagabond of lowly life, a child of the American cotton belt, who spends much of his time walking, talking, dancing, and drinking with his friends, including the British West Indian Malti, an English speaking Negro boy, Ginger, Dengo, quote, a Senegalese who preferred the company of Malti and his pals to that of his own countrymen, and Bugsy, a fellow African-American who is, quote, always aggressive of attitude. 
each of them more or less homeless by choice and circumstance. They routinely gather or sleep on the beaches of Marseille with, quote, many others besides them, white men, brown men, black men, Finns, Poles, Italians, Slavs, Maltese, Indians, Negroids, African Negroes, West Indian Negroes. And this is the language that McKay is using in the novel. Many of the men who live on the beach are sometimes stevedores or deportees from various nations like Banjo, except that Banjo threw away his American passport so he would be deported from the US in the first place. Really interesting character. Banjo is the quintessential vag vagabond on a tramp with the desire to put together an orchestra and drink sweet wine, both goals which endear him to Ray, a Haitian writer and wandering intellectual who observed Banjo and his friends from afar until they connect in the second part of the novel. So here's where you can see why I might be in an English department, although I don't, I don't really think it's totally justified. Um, this heterogeneous sampling of the African diaspora is largely narrated in the third person while mediated through Banjo and Ray. And in the opening passage pages, Banjo's aimless wanderings are described as follows. His life was a dream of vagabondage. He had seen a little of Europe before having touched some of the big commercial ports, but he had never arrived at the sailor's great port, Marseille. All through his seafaring days, Banjo had dreamed dreams of the seaman's dream port. Before arriving, Banjo had no plan, no set purpose, no single object in coming to Marseille. But after spending all of his money and selling all of his clothes, Banjo began to plan an orchestra to solve his money worries without requiring a steady job. Banjo's interest in evading work doesn't mean he's a slouch, however. Um, the scholar Brent Hayes Edwards has argued that Banjo demonstrates that Claude McKay was really interested in methods of undermining racial capitalism that did not rely on black uplift narratives that were common in many black American intellectual circles, um, nor in relying on the Bolshevik internationalism which deemed the embrace of a proletariat identity as key to centering the race and class peoples of the world. Rather, um, Banjo represents black men who would rather busk at cafes for wine and quote, beg for food from sympathetic black crews on the Mediterranean than work under the racist capitalism that was the only available mode of labor relations. In fact, the relationship between Banjo's drifters and the white laborers who work on the docks and ships tends to be typified more often by racial violence, um, much like the relationship between our vagabonds and French immigration authorities at various parts of the novel. But while the French state and the discernible meaning white proletariat of the novel want to render these vagabonds like Banjo legible, by compelling them to function within the boundaries of what they consider civilized. The character Ray says, the vagabonds loose instinctive way of living was more deeply related to their own self-preservation than all the social morality lessons with which they had been inculcated by the wiseacres of the civilized machine. To vagabond then is to dream of playing the banjo alongside other black musicians as a method of survival of being, of emancipation, of forging Black intimacy through Black music. The practice of vagabondage, a verb that McKay borrows and massages from the French vagabondé, is the expression of an other sort of Black modality and way of being. This is a modality that is conditioned by the colonial state's long tendrils extended into the Caribbean and Africa and Asia but it is also a modality that resists its own appropriation by these forces. Vagabondage is encapsulated in the phrase that's often stamped on black seamen's papers by European immigration authorities in the novel, nationality doubtful. Banjo portrays a way of being black that steals itself back from the state and society alike, unlegislated, unallowed, disobedient. So on the periphery of this rude an anarchy of vagabondage, which is what Ray calls it, there is another and way more ambivalent community at the edges of the novel's um, heteroglossia of Black and African vagabonds and vagrants, and that would be the Arabs. 
quote, there is a great gulf of biological profundity between the ochre skinned North Africans and the black dwellers below the desert, McKay writes, continuing, the Negro's sensual dream of life is pulls apart from the Arab's hard realism. The Arabs in the novel, unlike the whites characters or the French working class in London proletariat, who may frequent the same bars and cafes as the vagabonds, are not antagonistic towards the black vagabonds um, like uh, the beach, um, like Banjo and his crew. They're there and not there. They rarely are remarked upon and infrequently in conversation with this group of vagabonds. The Arabs go to different cafes. They listen to different music. They are quiet, watchful, and they stick with their own. An exception, however, presents herself early on in this little novel without a plot. A quote, little olive-toned woman of indefinable age, clean-faced, not young, and far from old, with an amorous charm around her mouth. Her name is Letna, and she is first introduced by Malti as follows. Quote, a little woman bumming like us on the beach, I don't know whether she is Arabian or Persian or Indian. She knows all languages. Though Latna is called Arab in almost every single scholarly work on banjo, I think this is actually way more unclear in the novel when you read it carefully. Um, Latna is centrally in the text as a woman, the only woman who bums around with and is more or less respected by all the men in banjo's circle. And Arab is never a term that Latna uses to describe herself, nor is it how she's referenced by the group of men she falls in with. She's soft, her phenotype is first just portrayed as olive or oriental. She often, quote, shuns the Arab speaking men with whom she was identified by language to both Banjo and Malti's great delight. She is also hailed as a, quote, dirty black whore by a French woman at one point in the novel, to which Latna responds, you bigger white whore. Latna is described as exotic, foreign, superior in her difference, but all the while is stubbornly racially and culturally ambiguous. What she tends to be is the question that a lot of scholars of the Black International ask of Latna, but maybe what Latna is is not the right question for scholars of Black studies at all. If we consider Black cultural studies scholar Kevin Kwashi's moving assertion that, quote, relation is a principle of intersubjectivity or riskful surrender to being in shared otherness. We might understand that by virtue of her place among the beach boys of Marseille, Latna is drawn into a capacious inter interpretation of blackness that's taking shape in McKay's rendering of Marseille, even if it's only legible in the specific moment in space and time in which blackness is being imagined this way, the when and the where of its manifestation. So when Ray asks towards the end of the novel, I always wonder, Latna, what you really are. He is asking for something Latna cannot name, an identity with firm roots, a legible and possessive trajectory in a novel that generally avoids all such legibility and linearity. Whether Oriental, Arabese, or eventually in Latna's own words at the end of the novel, the child of a negress, Latna is enveloped into the community of beach boys to which Banjo and Ray belong. Her racial ambiguity and rootlessness are hinged to the novel's imagined community of black men um, who were quote, not of the humble tribe of humanity due to their blackness, but also felt they lacked a quote, wholesome contact with racial roots, or in other words, words didn't know where they came from, didn't care and wouldn't miss it even if they did. So the Black Vagabonds of Marseille enact a Blackness that's not reliant on a singular trace in history, nor even a prediction of how their Blackness will be understood in the future. The Blackness of Banjo is endlessly capacious, honoring the ungeographic and multi-directional formation that the late cultural theorist Stuart Hall once proposed, that rather than being fixed or uniform across space and time, quote, race works like a language. So I propose that Latna is Black in the space and time of this novel and across the vernaculars of the novel's many characters because she is a vagabond like them. It's a tactic of Black study, convivial and unable to be categorized, disobedient in its sociality and subversive to the race and labor relations of this court of empire to trouble the very hegemonic understandings of ourselves, our subjects, and our work. 
if Claude McKay's Marseille is an outpost of the African diaspora and Latinez becoming black in the space and time of the novel is quote, through an identification with blackness as a condition of affinity and camaraderie beyond knowable signs and signals such as homeland language and appearance, then Latinez whether or not Arabness may untroublingly also be black. So I have a little section here on like, why vagabonds hate nations and passports and things like that. I'm gonna skip it because I'm really tired and I feel like maybe everyone else is at sunshine. Um, so I'm gonna close out uh, now with um, Latna's uh, excessive or exceeding the language of blackness that's available to Banjo Ray in the questions. And to all of us who are mired into organizational pr principles of difference, that must be managed or contained. So think about every time you fill out a form and you're checking the box of which race, racial identity you belong to, but those are not capacious enough to actually um, represent any kind of combination of our respective identities or subjectivities. So these are the organizational principles of difference that these vagabonds and Latna are, are ex they basically exceed, right? By virtue of the fact that they refuse to be legible to the state. Latna reminds us that blackness is as multifaceted and complicated as those people who are contained by blackness as violence and steal it back as emancipation. Latna causes trouble for the boundaries of blackness. She steals blackness back from linearity and legibility. She walks and talks and dances and cares and caretakes for it. Her phenotype and gender render her at the margins of blackness as it is presumed to be, perhaps making her the unlikeliest possible scenario participant for the imagined orchestra of Banjo's dreams, but she is nevertheless at the heart of it. And I'm wondering now if I have another slide, I kind of forgot. Yeah, I do. All right, so Latna was following precisely the same line of living as they. She came as a pal. She was made one of them. Whatever personal art she might use as a woman to increase her chances was her own affair. She's probably a prostitute in the novel, FYI. It did not matter if Latna was inclined to be amorous with any of them. Perhaps it was better so. She remained just one of the game. Because Latna is there, vagabonding and affable, these vagabonds insist we must make room for her in this iteration and interpretation of Blackness. So to return as something like an ending to the novel's subtitle, A Story Without a Plot, Banjo is not without a plot. It is merely without direction. The novel, like its author, navigates the movement of Black people, Black lives from space to space, across nation and language, beyond home, but always finding new homes. The diaspora and its denizens are profound, gregarious, transnational. This we students of Black studies already know. In Banjo, a determining qualitative link to Blackness is also itinerant, hustling, panhandling, busking, and yes, walking, talking, dancing, and singing. It is directionless and directed, an orchestra of forced displacement, subversive mobility, unlegislated space, and speculative time. It diverges and multiplies across space and time, it is language and it is study, it is our intellectualism. This blackness is a process of becoming again and again and producing knowledge through difficulty and difference, always doing this work together. So as our imaginary of the diaspora surpasses constraint, so too does black study allow us to surpass any disciplinary boundaries we might feel beholden to. It surpasses the organizational authority of the academy entirely. It reveals and exceeds our borders as scholars, our and other ways of thinking. It recognizes the scope and upends the orientation of our work. To do black study is to vagabond, to work as vagabonds. It is interdisciplinary, but not undisciplined. Rather to quote Catherine McKittrick, it is disobedient. It is effort and rigor and studied labor, but it is focused in every direction and from every directionality. Black studies and black study is on a mission. And that mission is what Fred Moten is fond of using and I am fond of repeating that black study is always on a mission to try and save the earth. Thank you. 
I think I stopped here. Um, and I guess the goal now is for all of you to keep me from talking. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions or comments or wants to debate a little bit, uh, please feel free to unmute or participate in the chat. Hi, Sophia. My name is Dave Williams. I'm an adjunct faculty at Oakton Community College, and I'm in the midst of reading the 1619 Project and learning more about everything. And it, I wonder if you could help me by referring me to any great texts that talk about the Arab slave trade, mm. the fact that it was kind of a precursor to the um, Atlantic triangular trade that um, we've become familiar with in this country. Um, because, you know, the, the book was very helpful in, in the chapter, I think, entitled Dispossession, where it talked about the um, difficult relationship between African Americans and Native Americans, mm -hmm. sort of the historical context of that. And I'm kind of feeling the same way about African Americans and Arab Americans. I'm, I'm very conflicted in terms of the roles um, that, that were played. So, and any good any good books that could set me on the right path or, or teach me more about the subject? Yeah, certainly. That's a great question, too. Um, so, it's important to note that in Arabophone context in North Africa, for instance, um, there is an other history of enslavement and anti-Blackness that precedes uh, European colonization on the African continent and in Southwest Asia. So this is a really important history. Um, the scholar Eve Trout Powell, I'm gonna put her name in here, and, as well as Shuki al Hamad are great, two great um, scholars with, um, Eve has a couple of books and Shuki al has a great book on Black Morocco that illuminate more on what you're talking about, Dave, um, on the Arab slave trade, the trans-Saharan slave trade. Um, thank you, Khaled. Um, my colleague Khaled it also has, knows some of this history. Um, and, you know, it's also important to note though that there's, there is an important distinction between Arabophone peoples, let's say in North Africa and Southwest Asia and Arab American communities in the US. Because when you start moving um, through history, like migration, you start a new diaspora, you immigrate to a new country, uh, depending on the space and time in which you're doing so, you start to you know, take on other racial classifications that exist in the world. So anyone who, I don't know, if anyone else is a child of immigrants, um, you may have had the experience of like your parents kind of coming to the US and narrating their, like when they realized like that to be black was the worst thing to be in the US. And so a lot of like, let's say African immigrants who are phenotypically black, like my father, for instance, would be, um, would deny, right? Would push against being characterized or associated with black American peoples, even though they're getting treated like that in other aspects of their life because nobody's gonna bother to make the distinction for you. So this is how anti-blackness attaches itself to the process of immigration, for instance. And it's different across different communities and at different space and times. But I think that's really important to remember that the reason that Arab Americans are Caucasian on the census, for instance, is not because Arab Americans are white. It's be well, also not Caucasian, which nobody but you know a few people in the actual region of Europe are, um, but because Arab Americans could not become naturalized citizens unless they were white. And so went to court over a series of years, which uh, Sarah Galtieri, sorry, another book reference in her book Between Arab and White Documents, um, the history of both Arab and other um, non-Black immigrants uh, to the US, like going to court to be deemed legally white as a way of becoming naturalized citizens and how that replicates and reproduces anti-Blackness more broadly in immigrant communities of color, right? So um, these are really great, uh, those are really great questions and provocations, Dave, and these are really important histories. So I'm not an Arab Americanist, um, but hopefully Sarah's book can help folks who are curious about that. Yeah, Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hi, Sophia. Sorry, I'm going to keep my camera off because I'm in the middle of making a quick salad. But uh, I wanted to thank you um, for the talk. I, I am really excited about the book. I wondered if you could say more about, I'm really taken with this idea of, of Blackness as practice. Um, and you also said, you know, there are other ways like Blackness as a concept. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about what it means to think about Blackness as a as practice. Um, and yeah, yeah, I just want to hear more about how you're thinking about that, how that maybe like in the different texts and performances you're engaging, how that practice shifts or the different ways that it shows up. Thank you again. Thank you, Adam. Um, that's a really great question. Um, so I think I kind of take my cues to um, from Richard Iton's um, provocation of diaspora, that it means being suspicious of any authenticating geography um, that demands fixity um, or hegemony. And that's not to say that blackness is necessarily like the result of a hegemonic interpretation of, of the salience of race globally. But what happens when we consider, let's say what we might conceive of as boundaries of Black being. So why does it stop at the Sahara, even though we know, going back to Dave's question, that Black people are not only through the uh, slave trade, but previously and thereafter of their own will, traversing these boundaries and creating and adapting new communities as they move throughout Africa, Asia, Europe, and other spaces. Um, how is it that we, you know, think of Blackness as maybe like a politically coherent or racially coherent knowledge across language? Um, and so I think my assertion or my, how I'm trying to think about the practice of black being um, is thinking about how black being coheres in alternative contexts, languages and spaces, um, how it sounds different, how it looks different, how it's conceived of differently, where it could be either quite capacious and inclusive in political moments, like let's say Pan-Africanism, or it can be quite um, narrow um, for deliberate political purpose that are also valuable, such as black nationalism. Um, and so I think that's not a great answer <laughs> to what is a good, really good question. Um, but what happens when we think of blackness like black studies uh, as not something that's defined in opposition to whiteness or in opposition to Euro-Americanness, but as self-constituted in alternative ways, right? And in another part of the map, unmapping this, um, you know, attention to fixity um, or an authenticating geography where we associate black people is from here and not from here. When in fact, they are uh, black thought, black people, black thought, black culture is moving um, always through the diaspora, yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that question. I'm gonna to have to think about that more. Um, Brandon? Uh, cool, thank you for your talk. Um, so I was thinking about um, like nomadism and like whether, um, like how that might intersect or depart from vagabondage. Um, and so there's kind of like the, kind of precipitated by like an artist friend of mine in Paris who I'll just drop this he brought a dune from he like transported all this sand to Paris and like created this dune like within um a gallery and kind of thinking about like you know the desert dune sand as things that you know may not be the best things to build on that are like literally in in motion and thinking about nomadism as something that maybe doesn't like respect natural borders or has doesn't respect like uh, like political borders um and um also like the the trope of because there are a lot of <clears throat> tribes within like north africa that are like agricultural and thinking about kind of like nomadism as in its relation to like ideas of like primitivity or whatever. Um, so yeah, any thoughts in like that area would be interesting to hear, thanks. Yeah, no, thank you, that's that's really interesting. Um, so first of all, um, you know, one of, a, uh, there's a PhD candidate in the English department who also takes up these kinds of um, conceptual, terminologies of like vagabond and peon and toiler. Um, 
uh, to and looks at how it moves across Black literature. Um, and I don't want to like embarrass them, but their name is Noah Hansen. If anyone's at U Chicago, and their work is amazing. Um, but uh, I stick with vagabondage, and and I think because first of all, McKay uses it and borrows it from the French vagabondé, where it lives right as an action, um, in such an interesting way. Um, and McKay is is translating vagabondage as or vagabonding right as a practice of the diaspora, right, a way of a way of escaping, a, a way, a, a method of subversive mobility or resisting one's movement or um, stasis being compelled or categorized or organized by the state, um, right? So Banjo loses his passport on purpose so that he can be deported uh, and to go to France. This is not something that we see very often, um, you know, in when we think about like the struggles of immigration or movement across borders. Um, but there are a lot of interesting passports um, that I talk about in my book, like James Baldwin was fond of ruminating on the power of the American passport. Shirley Graham and W.E.B. Du Bois's passports were confiscated by the U.S. government. Um, Franz Fanon, um, the Martinican revolutionary and psychoanalyst, he had a forged Libyan passport that enabled his ability to be serve as um, the Front de Liberation Nationale's um, envoy to Ghana. Um, there's all of these ways that passports are uh, and national belonging and citizenship are evaded deliberately, um, even as states make something like a passport or losing one's passport necessary to be recognized or unrecognized in other ways. Um, and so you're right, though, that there's also this, you know, practice of nomadism that lives very much like very visibly in North Africa. Um, so, I mean, there's the taboo community in Libya, right, who were deliberately targeted for Arabization by Muammar Gaddafi's re regime. Those were nomadic peoples, uh, Bedouin peoples in Palestine who have been routinely displaced by the Israeli state um, in, or in order to occupy a desert, right, literally, um, speaking of deserts. So I think nomadism here doesn't signal what I want vagabondage to do, but you're right that nomad nomadic traditions, we often do think of maybe in the US context, at least as like uncivilized or pre-civilization, when in reality, those are also lived practices of, you know, constant attention to movement, and in many cases, evading boundaries, borders, um, and the strategic organizing of difference that the nation state is committed to. So it's another long way of not quite answering a question, but I appreciate the question. Um, Paul. Um, sorry, I'm having uh, Zoom issues. Sorry, Professor, that was great. And like, I, I have multiple questions, but I'll, I'll reduce it to one for the, the sake of time um, and ask you the rest next quarter in class. But um, so I, I, um, I taught a class on Black Studies at the School of the Art Institute this past fall. And um, for the sake of the kind of students I worked with, um, we had to kind of distill the theory and, and get to the sharper points. And we um, read an interview with the with Karen and Barbara Fields about racecraft. Mm. Um, and it put us in a tense spot um, because the argument um, made sense to most of us in the class. And it, um, it seemed reasonable that something like race could be um, as, as a construct was constructed by racism and social practices like that. But especially the black students in the class were extremely offended because it would mean the divesting of something that was deep to who they were, but also to their livelihoods as artists since so much of their art was related to race. Um, and then Professor Ken Warren has addressed this in some of his articles about black studies and stuff. So for like those of us black studies scholars who both see the value in studying blackness, as you pointed out, but also are recognize the dangers of, um, you know, reifying a social construct. How, how do you navigate that, like, personally as a scholar and try to deal with something like that? Because when one of the students asked me and, and she said explicitly, I don't believe in this, this is wrong, I, I, I didn't have, like, an answer and uh, response to what she had to say because I realized I, I, yeah, I was unsure of how to navigate those kind of, you know, conflicting views as well. 
That's an excellent question. Um, and yes, my colleague, Ken, and I, well, Ken Warren is actually my senior mentor. Um, so I don't know, we'll say he's a very generous mentor in that we work on totally opposite directions of similar questions. Um, and yet we have really rich conversations and debates um, about something like blackness, right? And is it is investing in something like a black diaspora reifying um, what is essentially, you know, race crap, what is an invention um, that is inherently tied to like racial violence, uh, racial capitalism, white supremacy. Um, and yes, it is. And also race continues to have global salience, right? It has a material reality that whether or not I believe in, you know, race or I believe in blackness, um, is going to have material impact on peoples who are identified as Black or as Latinx or as Asian, right? Um, this is something that we can't escape. So while it is perfectly fine, and I think important, and many scholars do this really well, and many other scholars, I think, would have better maybe immediate resources that come to mind about this, um, while race is an invention and is completely a social construct, those social constructs have a material reality and impact on all of us, no matter where we are in the world. And this is something actually I think Stuart Hall really navigated well in his work. Um, you know, looking at the salience of something like blackness in the Caribbean community in England, which is what the community he was also a part of in his life. Um, and wanting, of course, to, you know, move away from race as a defining feature of how one lives safely or well in the world, right? How one ex escapes the constraints of compelled labor, racial capitalism, racial violence, but understanding also that there needs to be a lot of work done and on the ground to change the face of the world in that way. So how do we make a new world? How do we completely you know, reconstruct and make a world where race is not real, where race is not something that defines who we are and how we navigate the world. We might do something like what Cedric Robinson um, suggests in the conclusion to his amazing black Marxism, which is embrace the incredible singularity of the formation of the African diaspora and all of our differences across it, but use that as a powerful root of a community that can maybe create another world in a collective sense. Um, yeah, so I'm really attached to the speculative possibilities of like investing in blackness and at the same time I also recognize that something like Arabness is a racial process that emerges from anti blackness right so that's also true, while at the same time I believe in the speculative potential of um, connecting with the African diaspora. Um, and I, I guess that kind of brings me to Ken's question in the chat, which is very useful. Um, I mean, what brought me to this? Banjo was the first time I saw this, like I recognized this um, confluence of the African and the Arabophone. Um, but actually it's much more personal, which is just, I was really confused about how my family were like black in one place and like Caucasian in another and Arab in another, or just Muslim in the case of France. Like, so you show up in France and of course race isn't real in France. So you're automatically defined by other factors that I'm sure have no racial component at all. Um, like being like visibly Muslim in some way. Um, and of course the answer to that is, uh, politics and racism and how blackness moves and sounds different and looks different depending on when and where we are. And I wanted to know why. And I especially wanted to know why in like a personal relationship to my own um, familial experiences with that. So uh, that's, it's, and also cause when I was a junior in college I took uh, my first black studies class in my junior year. And I spent the next year and a semester frantically trying to pack in all the remaining classes I need for a double major. And I had a lot, a lot of fights with people about whether Egyptians were African or not. And we would like go hard at it. Um, and so I was like, I'm gonna have to actually write this thing myself if I want an answer to this question. Thank you for that. Of course. <laughs> I'll throw out another question. Sure. Um, I'm curious about if you have any thoughts on, and this is me speaking out my words and I'll go on to explain it more if it doesn't make sense, but 
thoughts on nomadism that isn't actually nomadism. Um, kind of, you were you're mentioning before just the topic of nomadism, but these days I have to think not just physical, um, uh, geographical relocations or just movement across your geographical planes, but I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to think these days about metaphysical relocations where maybe just a transition from, I say like a rural, I don't know, or just growing up in a rural area somewhere uh, in the United States and then coming to college or coming to somewhere that's like Chicago. And then, I don't know, I feel like there's some sort of, some, some topics that are intersecting there when discussing things related to the transition between high school and college, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and then while that may entail or, or involve a ge actual geographical relocation, I feel like I'm at, or I'm at, just have to pay respect to the metaphysical relocation of oneself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I understand what you mean. Um, you know, there's a way in which um, I suppose all of us in various aspects of our lived experience. I mean, I'm, I'm not from Chicago. I don't know how many of you are or are not, but that's where I'm sitting right now on, you know, occupied land, um, on stolen and occupied land. Um, but, you know, there's some element of like all of us sort of embracing a, a rootlessness from time to time throughout our lives in order to move forward in some capacity. Usually, maybe not always. Um, I don't know that I have any thoughts per se on like the metaphysical nature of nomadism, um, but I will say that uh, certainly many of the epistemological crises that strike uh, authors that I look at like James Baldwin and Claude McKay and uh, William Gardner Smith, um, Shirley Graham Du Bois and many others in my research, uh, what usually prompts them to start rethinking how they understand their place in the world and their relation to other Black people is moving from one place to another. Whether it's from Georgia to Harlem or from, you know, LA to Morocco, right? So this prompts something, I think, where we have to seek out uh, what I call translationalism, like we have to start translating and learning other languages, but also identifying what's missing from both languages we're working across. Um, so we can forge new ways of identify, identifying things or features that may not have a language built, uh, built already for us to use. Um, oh, hey Khaled. So, <laughs> so translation is relevant to the work in a very conceptual sense, but also literal, which is to say I account for Arabophone um, archival stuff in my research as well as Francophone. Um, but also uh, to think about translation is to think about the formation of new vernaculars through which something like the Afro-Arab can be understood and recognized. Um, and so I look at successful translations where everyone like figures it out and they're happy in the end. Mistranslations where somebody misidentifies something or mistakes something for something else. Um, and missed translations when two people are using two different languages or the same language maybe and speaking over one another. For instance, when I use the word black to talk about black people um, and my Sudanese colleague that um, I get in a lot of debates with uses the term azra or blue because it's not right to use the Arabic word for black for people in Sudan for a certain generation. So it's blue, right? Black for people is offensive. Blue is fine. Um, that's an example of like missed translation where two different um, categories exist across two different languages. And it's really hard to find a mutual ground where they become intelligible. Um, so that's a really, really quick answer because I know we're at time. Um, but I really appreciate that uh, question, Khaled, and also I appreciate everyone's questions. This has been very nice. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sophia, and thanks everyone for your questions. Um, we'll close it out now, but stay tuned on the listservs for um, information about upcoming uh, Research Bites conversations for spring quarter. Take care, everyone. <laughs>